we managed to survive uh, till today, Thursday, and uh, today we have a presentation, first presentation at the plenary session, Professor uh, Joseph Gotarba, uh, the experience of music in the third age, the con Convergence of Theory and Method. He's a music master in sociology. Then please introduce us to this wonderful field thank you, sir. of research. Okay, thank you. You have it, of course. Okay, I'm glad to see everybody back here after an evening of partying. Everybody's wide awake. This is great. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a strange presentation for me, and I'll, I won't give, tell you why right now, but we'll be talking about some things that we did last night. So um, we experienced last night. So that's going to be, I hope that'll be fun. Uh, the experience of music in the third age, the convergence of theory and methods. I want to talk about this convergence of theory and methods to stay in tune with, with one of our themes that, in this conference here. And uh, uh, I know Scott's very interested in this notion of theory and methods. I want to talk about how you can integrate theory and methods as part of the ongoing process of doing qualitative research and to not necessarily talk about them or write about them as independent things because that interaction is everything's holistic, right? That's one of our hallmarks. And so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, uh, that, that kind of approach. And uh, that's where I'm at. That's kind of close to Austin. We're about 30 minutes away from Austin, Texas. Um, and that's where we're at now. Okay, here's the basic research question. How do we study and conceptualize music experience among the aging and the elderly? Well, I've got aging and elderly, and you might be saying, now wait a minute, what do you, what's the difference? Well, you know, that's a big topic in terms of gerontological uh, studies and aging studies, is where do we make boundaries and draw lines between cohorts of people uh, across the, the, the life, lifespan? Um, well, that's something that, that in doing this research, I, I approached this very commonsensically because um, uh, what I was very interested in doing was doing some follow-up on the folks I studied when I did my Baby Boomer rock and roll book going back now to 2013 it came out. And um, uh, at the time I was doing that research, uh, the people I was talking, writing about were more or less in their 60s middle 60s, they're very productive, and of course they weren't retired yet because you don't retire in the United States anymore until you're 70 for all kinds of legal and as well as financial reasons. Uh, but what happened to them? Because uh, uh, there were some interesting things going on in middle age for them, and it'd be nice sociologically to see how that turns out. So uh, who am I actually looking at? Well, I ended up coming up with uh, a cohort, men and women, of course, ages 70 and above. And again, 70 is that key age. That's, for example, when in the United States you can retire with Social Security, full Social Security. And culturally speaking, it's one of those things where people like to say, I'm going to work till I'm 70. I can handle it. I'm in good shape, etc." More people predict they're going to work till they're 70 than actually do. But uh, it's part of the culture of aging now going. And again, Please bear with me, most of what I'm saying is, is based on, on the states. And so uh, I'm gonna be asking you to give me any kind of relevant contrast you can as you move along. So, uh, but I'm, I'm dealing with people who are just old, okay? And what does that mean? Uh, in, in the states at least, I know in Great Britain to some degree, um, when you talk about old people and research, social behavioral research, the emphasis increasingly is on categorizing old timers in terms of problems, symptoms. And so there's lots of research going on dementia, Alzheimer's, issues of senility, okay? Well, I decided not to deal with those categories and to ignore them and instead simply approach my uh, cohorts in terms of just being old. And if they have these other problems, maybe, maybe not. But I don't want to prejudge the fact that there may be cognitive or behavioral problems or even physical problems among old people because there aren't. You know, a lot of people just simply, simply get old. And I want to capture that. Okay, um, but it's at this point when it, it was valuable for me to go to the gerontological literature and to start bringing theory in at this point. 
overall, this project is very grounded theory based, and so I'm not generating a lot of preconceived uh, hypotheses and stuff like that. Uh, but instead, I want to see how uh, in the other world of research on old timers, how they categorize uh, a, a people. And maybe that can help inform me in terms of sampling and in terms of generating some original kinds of research questions. And so one of the better sources I came across is the one I'll cover today briefly. Higgs and Gilliard, 2015. A couple of Brits, I believe who did a, just a real, they call it kind of a, a radical approach to studying uh, aging. Uh, I don't think so, so much. I think it's just a little bit, little bit up to date compared to the lot, lot of the literature. And they're, uh, they're interactionists uh, at heart. They do talk about, uh, and they spend a lot of time writing about status passage, one of the major concepts from uh, Anselm, Anselm Strauss. And, um, what they write about is primarily the fourth age. And they, this whole framework that these gerontologists use is based upon organizing life, the lifespan in terms of four ages. The first two were birth and through early adulthood and, and, and the productive years. The ones I'm most interested in is sorting out the fourth and the third stages which are the most difficult ones to, uh, to, to sort out analytically. Uh, first of all, and I eliminate the fourth stage following this definition that uh, uh, Higgs and Gilliard give us about fourth age, real old timers, last stage in life. The fourth age offers no opportunity to be able to create a status or articulate a lifestyle, nor is there reason to trust that previous choices based on personal agency, will be honored or even acted upon. This is pretty, I wouldn't say sad, this is pretty definitive about people in the last stage of life. Uh, they're not going anywhere else, right, in terms of, of, of enhancing a, a status or a, or a profile. Um, and so you can deal with the choice that nobody cares, with the, opportunity, with the fact that nobody cares about what they know, what they've experienced, what their expertise may be over the years. Um, personal agency is, uh, is to be ignored. When you get really, really old, you're just old. It becomes a super master status. Okay, that's, that's their argument. And I think there's a lot to that. So I back off and go down to the third age, as they define it. And uh, the third age is what I would call the post-career age. And again, this is in Western industrialized uh, societies. Um, post-career is like when you retire. And what happens to you in that fairly long stretch of life before you get really old and sick? Um, and as Higgs and Gilliard indicate, uh, and a lot of this comes from the British experience, uh, there's a lot of things that aren't available anymore to third-age people, nor is it really needed as it used to be. The notion, for example, of an old-age pensioner, which I remember a common term used for my grandfathers, right? You're an old-age pensioner, which meant, meant that when you retired at 65 back then, you were old, and you were a pensioner, which meant you, know, you were kind of a ward of either the state or the corporation at that point. Your income was set if you're a pensioner, right? Uh, well, we don't, that's not a, that kind of concept doesn't have as much currency anymore. Uh, the standard of living is risen among people who are in the third age, okay? Uh, the greatest growth in income and resource availability is among retired people at least in the States, okay? They're getting rich, the rest of us are getting poor. Uh, they're healthier than they've ever been. You can be retired and not necessarily be, you know, on actively using your Medicare. Uh, they're healthier because in general, people in the third age now live much healthier lifestyles than their parents, or my, my grandparents did, okay? Um, long stay hospitals and infirmaries, which at least in, in, in Great Britain were fairly standard locations to house older people. 
I guess they're not in business much anymore. So, um, and they're gone, according to the authors. And for them and for me, the key age on entry into the third age is around 70. So I'm going to use that heuristically, okay? Okay, in the late uh, second age. Um, middle age, still working. Various music experiences support the emergence of various experiences of self. When you're in the middle age in Western society, music is still an important cultural resource for you. As your self continues to evolve over time, music is still there to tell you how to grow older, how to enjoy your work after many years, how to rejuvenate your relationships, or how to break them. So music is a really practical resource all the way through middle age, okay? And um, so this, because the self is still a viable activity for people in their, in their 60s. Uh, we call these baby boomers in the States. I've been corrected several times about this term. There are no baby boomers other place in the world. I guess not. They're just old people. But for baby boomers, music can uh, uh, facilitate various styles of self. You can develop a religious self based upon music, pop music especially. Uh, an intimate self dealing with relationships. Uh, you can develop an e-self by getting involved with uh, satellite music and serious radio we have in the States for your car and stuff like this. And you can be more or less a parental self using music as a tool, if not a weapon, against your kids. <laughs> so as they become teenagers, turn that so-and-so noise down. Of course, increasingly, that warning comes the other way, as teenagers today will scream at their parents to turn down that loud old rock and roll, as they like their more controlled dance music. Okay. Um, so as we move into the third age cohort, um, Higgs and Gilliard used the term cultural field. And I like this idea a lot. Uh, this refers to a person's participation, or refers to the way a person's participation, not identity, defines his cultural field. It's your activity or participation in social events and activities Okay, that determines how people deal with you and label you, if you will, in some cases, as an aging person in the third age. Because identity is becoming increasingly fluid. What's middle age? What's old? These things are pretty much up for grabs. But so how do we judge each other? How active we are. And this is how doctors judge patients. This is how social workers judge clients. Okay, are you getting around? Are you rehabbed? All those kind of kind of ideas fit in here. Here's the basic principle I have at this point in my research. Uh, in the third age, music as a resource for self fades as music increasingly serves as a feature, not the essence, a fe the feature of collective or community activity. A lot of nice big words. Let me, let me break that down a little bit. Uh, when you get into the third age, when you get older, your need or even desire to work on shaping yourself any more than, you, than it is fades away. The, 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 the profit, the rewards of working yourself, well, I'm going to be a different kind of person, I'm going to be a different kind of religion, I'm going to be a different kind of something, it's not worth the trouble. So, in, so your self-work slows down, but what happens is that music which is a very powerful cultural resource through life up until late adulthood, that fades into the background. Music becomes increasingly part of the context of everyday life as you get older. Now, I know that's a broad generalization, but I want, you, I want you to bear with me on this. It becomes a feature that's background to you. In other words, your active engagement with music, going to the record store, going to concerts, doing these kind of active music kind of activities, that fades away for probably obvious reasons, right? Who, who's got the energy to go look through the record racks anymore, even though they're disappearing? 
Okay? I'm going to go to a concert with a bunch of crazy teenagers. I'll go to Polish karaoke with, with Polish graduate students. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, staying away from that. I'll watch the TV programs late at night. But seriously, what it is is that the self is something that will kind of age like cheese does in a way. It becomes stable. All right? And where do you get your music when you get to be 65, but especially 70 years old? Back from the community. Okay, back from the community. Ironically, music becomes more of a social activity the older you get. So that after many years of being a collector of music, a, a, a kind of sewer of music history and stuff like this, very kind of individual activities in adulthood. All of a sudden, the older you get, the more you find yourself in social situations where music is a, a feature of what's going on and why you're there. Okay? The late third age may be among the most socially active music experiences of all for many people. Again, during middle age when you don't have the energy or time to go to concerts, the older you get, the more you find yourself in places where music is one of the primary activities. As was the case last night. Did any of us go to the dinner at the palace last night because there was going to be a Beatle cover band playing? I didn't. I didn't know. I would have gone especially because of that, but I didn't know. But that wasn't my primary purpose. But music was embedded into the overall activity last night, right? Became a key part of it. All right? And we enjoyed it a lot. But that's what happens increasingly over light. Someone, someone else is kind of providing you with musical experiences the older you get. Okay? What's my methodology? Uh, basic uh, grounded theory in this particular study. Um, and it's in a technical sense, I do a lot of hanging around and finding out where older people are, where they spend their time, and investigating the place that music has in that kind of activity. Why, why is that a, a kind of a preferred method? Well, music is ubiquitous. It's all over. You don't have to look far to find music being performed. And it's in everybody's lives, totally. We hear it on the elevator, we hear it on the radio when we're driving, it's on television, music is all over the church, all over the place. Uh, so it's not a great task to find music. What I need to do and what I've been doing is circulating around these social activities that involve people 70 and plus and see what music is. The theme of this research is discovered social situations where older people can be found where either music is present or they are able to talk about music in these groups. So I've been doing some things like conducting, I wouldn't call them focus groups, more group conversations like at the local community centers around Central Texas, where if you have coffee and cookies at 10 o'clock in the morning, you've got old timers lined up out the door. But they'll, they'll, once they get in and realize what I'm asking them, they, I can't shut them up talking about rock and roll. In this group, 70 plus, it's amazing how many of them were at Woodstock. Anybody remember what I'm talking about? I've heard also, there must have been like 14 million people at Woodstock. And they, <laughs> and they tell you what it was really about, you know, instructing me. So, so I listened to this. Uh, but they love talking about music. And of course, uh, music earlier in life is uh, much more dramatic for them than it is now, but it's not necessarily more present. Okay. Case study. Reston, Virginia. This is a oh, kind of a growing city um, just south of Washington, D.C., or west of, of Washington, D.C., and uh, it's, a, it's a planned community, and it's uh, one of those great cities where everything works. It's kind of freaky, though, that it's so well planned. You have a choice of only three colors on the roof of your townhouse. You know, coming from Texas, that's sinful to be that restricted in your roof. Thank you. Um, Anyhow, it's a very nice community, and who lives there? Well, my daughter and her husband. He works at the airport, near the airport, in, uh, at Dulles Airport in uh, Virginia. And uh, they just had a baby. Well, oh, no. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know this was, this was still in the PowerPoint. This is Brandon, Brandon Baderman. This is a shot when he was about two, uh, two months old. Isn't he gorgeous? 
Nice, he's very right. Okay, we're gonna get to that. He's, uh, he's two months old over here, and this is his Easter bunny that his grandpa Joe brought him. And uh, he, they kind of propped him up. He, he, of course, he wasn't normally sitting up like that at two months, but he propped him. And um, so my, my son-in-law, he's like a real techie, a real geek. Everything's electronic and rechargeable in his world, in the house. So to, to get Brandon to, to sleep, all right, he attached an iPad to his, cri his crib, so, he, so you can see the iPad, but especially hear it. And when Brandon is having trouble getting to sleep, they'll play a Katy Perry song from her new album. I forget which one it is, but it's one that has that nice beat to it that's a little bit fast, that kind of mesmerizes babies, and he's out cold to Katy Perry. <laughs> and I think that's very cool. Uh, if she was singing to me, I wouldn't be out cold, but that's another issue. Uh, so here's the rest in concert. Saturday night, let me see where I'm at. Oh, we got time, huh? Okay, I'll save a lot of time to talk. Um, every Saturday night in summer, they have an activity like on the town, rest in concerts on the town. And sometimes there's music, sometimes they have things like taste of resting kind of things, or they have different kind of food taste, tasting. Um, and uh, it's in the middle of, of town and it's one of those town centers that's brand new that they, that they put into suburbs and small towns nowadays to make it look like there's a center to the, to the subdivisions. And it's a real nice open space and everything. And this particular night when we were visiting, uh, Brandon and his parents, it was a music concert. And and I apologize for the picture, it's a little bit faded, and that's my fault for not pasting it correctly. Here's the back of an audience for this music event, okay? And what do we see? Um, old folks, this guy's probably happy he's there. This guy would, is, is, doesn't know if he's there. All kinds of people end up in couples, single people, they live and die by their folding lawn chair because that's exactly what they need for activities. There's no, this is outdoor kind of stuff. And it's, uh, in the back audience like this, it's mostly older people and it's very elegant, you know, kind of Virginia, Northern Virginia uh, location. Okay. And uh, the band that night was a Beatle cover band who somehow had rights or controlled the rights to Sgt. Pepper's club band as the name of their band. And what they did, okay, and Christoph, this was not as cool as your band. I'm not, I don't mean to imply that. But uh, uh, they had costume changes. And so for Sgt. Pepper, they, have, of course, had these kind of royalesque kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, kind of colorful things. And... Uh, for uh, Hard Day's Night, they had black beetle suits, right? And there was one more costume change on here. And uh, I found it very interesting. And, and what I do in a situation like this is go wander around and bother people and ask them, what do you make of this? And, and, and the old timers really liked the idea of the costume change. They thought that was really nice and that added something to music that may not have been their number one choice of music. But costume changes and history, it kind of made the uh, experience that much fuller. And you look down here, and, and towards the front of the stage, what do we got here? Two little girls jumping around to the Beatle music, much like the little kids yesterday after dinner, we're all dan dancing around like little kids, and I'm going to get back to that phenomenon in a minute. There's mom, and they get to go real close by these guys, You're just intrigued by them. Now, I find this to be an important slide in this whole show because it's kind of a transition phenomenon going on here. What do we see? We see dad, middle-aged kind of dad, right? With his wife, bringing their two kids to this uh, Beatles concert. And they got the two boys outfitted in Beatle t-shirts. They look a little old. So they might be somewhat original, I don't know. 
having a great time, and they're right up front by the stage, okay? And they're kind of right there where the action is, and the kids are dancing around a little bit, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. They were not going to sit down up front, right? They're by the stage to have a good time. Uh, going back towards the end of the audience in, in the facility, we got a whole range of different kinds of older folks. This gentleman was there by himself, a widower. And for him, when I asked him, what are you doing here? For him, the idea of being able to get out Saturday night to do something simple, okay, inexpensive, and enjoyable. He wasn't that concerned that it was the Beatles. Any kind of music would have been fine for him. And uh, he's a good, having a good time. Here's a couple that just recently moved to Virginia from New York City, okay? And we all know New Yorkers. Any New Yorkers here? Y'all move real fast, right? And they come here and they're just amazed that they can go into the public setting and just relax. You know, they don't have to use transportation. You can walk from their townhouse to this and have a great time. And uh, so they're just there to enjoy the serenity, the placid nature of, of the activity. The fact that it's Beatles music, great. Everybody thought it was great that it was, it was Beatles music, right? Better than other kinds of music at this type of event for them. Because Beatles music is everybody's music, right? It's not generational anymore. It's, it's classic, I think, really, by definition, what pop music's all about, and they do too. Here's a couple, and they came um, because they were visiting, and we can tell by their clothing, from Florida. They're coming up there to visit their kids. And they get to go to music, and they love going to music at different places, all right? But this is, of course, is outside, and the weather's nice, and it doesn't cost, and it's, you can get food right there, there's some food trucks behind the scene and everything. So for them, going to the concert is just a nice way to spend Saturday night. Two ladies, both of whom who left their husbands at home, but both of whose husbands didn't want to go. I don't know what they were going to watch on TV, but they, so they came together to have a good time and to watch the music. Big Beatles fans wanted to talk about the Beatles from 1965, from the beginning. Two gentlemen, one of which has uh, what close up appeared to be an original um, uh, Magical Mystery Tour t-shirt, in pretty good shape, but you, always gotta, you can always tell the, the originality of the t-shirts in a scene like this because sometimes you don't fully cover your tummy if you're an old timer. And uh, this one kind of didn't cover his tummy. Anyhow, um, they're having a great time. And what's significant, perhaps anthropologically, is the table. They were here by themselves, and I, I don't know if they, they're married or not. We never got into that. But the table is kind of interesting. We've got a cell phone there, and everybody's got a cell phone going. You know, that's ubiquitous. But we've got two coffee cups there. No beer, no alcohol, drinking coffee, why? Stay awake. That was a, probably the number one uh, beverage going down at this whole concert. So at the end of the table, again and back, the band is way up front. And they were able to, able to talk about the stock market and what Trump's up to and this and that, this and that. So it became like the occasion for two older men to socialize with each other. Now in, in the States in particular, that's not easy for men to do the older they get. They don't hang out and kibitz like women do, like their wives do, like this. It's, they got to work hard to maintain friendships and have something to get together about. These two guys talk about cutting lawns, again, Trump, stock market stuff, a little bit of everything. Um, and with a background of music. It wasn't the primary reason they were there. Okay, another gentleman by himself, but like a number of people in the crowd brought the dog. Okay. And a uh, real nice puppy. I probably saw 100 dogs out in this crowd of maybe 2,000 people in his own lawn chair. Okay. Um, 
that's one type of social situation that's attractive to people as you get older. Uh, but again, the crowd was split between families and old timers. It was like a three generation spread across this type of activity. Um, what are other kinds of social activities where music is, is uh, present, if not prominent? House concerts. And in Central Texas, this is a huge thing, where people, in fact, will get musicians, usually singer-songwriters on guitar, come to the house, you, you equip your house to hold maybe upwards of 40 people in a big dining room and living room combination. You hold a house concert, and very often it's to raise money for some type of charitable uh, cause in the community. So in this particular house concert, Kevin Walsh, who's a fairly, fairly famous uh, singer-songwriter in, in the country music world, um, he was invited. He, he made minimum money to do this, but uh, he was a draw for the, for, the, uh, for the neighbors. And the whole function of this type of activity is primarily neighbor, neighborliness. You go to this because your, other, your neighbors are going to be there. It's a way to get together and talk and for a good cause, but in someone's home. And is that nice and convenient if you don't want to get out there and deal with um, uh, public kinds of music? Okay, here's Kevin, and what they did here was to set up a, this tent in the backyard, because it was a very nice day. And he was singing his songs, and he just has a marvelous voice. He's more of a songwriter than a performer, so probably never heard of him. Um, but that's a way to raise money. This one, in fact, was raising money for what was called Wimberley Alive. We had a big flood in the neighboring town by us back in 2015. And they're still raising money for, for the folks rebuilding, and here was one of the many activities. Uh, the community coffee house. Uh, this is all over the place. A coffee house will have concerts, and what's the attraction to old timers, to a coffee house, coffee, <laughs> and, and 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 again, a civilized crowd. You know, this is like others like yourself are going to be in the audience. And so, this particular example is uh, someone that y'all are way too young to remember, Ray Wiley Hubbard. And uh, this particular community event takes place every month, once a month, in Wimberley, Texas. And it's at the Methodist Church. And since we're so close to Austin, um, the leaders of this, this program were able to bring in some fairly, fairly good and somewhat uh, renowned uh, performers. Now this guy is Ray Wiley Hubbard. And his, his great notoriety came up about probably 40 years ago. He penned a song called Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother. Ringing a bell with anybody? No. Um, it was kind of a hippie song, and it was interesting back in the 60s because it was a hippie and redneck song. It had two audiences for it. Well, that was his, uh, his, his big deal, but he's still on the circuit and stuff like that. And so what you do is once a month, and it's early because the concert is over by 9 o'clock, um, what we have over here is uh, you go there, and for a dollar and a half, you get a piece of pie, pizza, and a tamale. So everything is cost efficient too. And they raise money for the charities that are kind of like organized by the church. Now, um, you're saying, well, you do a lot of stuff like this in Central Texas, what about the rest of the world? And this is taking place all over on Discovery. This particular event uh, took place at the Culture Austin. Where's, where's my help on this? Um, Culture Austin Community Center in Sweden, right outside of Uppsala. And uh, there was a band playing on a Sunday afternoon in the community center, Lisa Listrom and band, and she's fairly popular in, 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 uh, in Sweden, kind of a blues singer. And it's an all-generations event, the way it's advertised. And here they are. Lisa's over here in the corner here singing has her band behind her, and it's kind of a blues rock band, so they're kind of loud, all right? 
And you say, there must be a ton of teenagers in a crowd for something like, like this. Well, not quite. I'm not sure if this picture shows it extremely well, but there's a mixture of families, middle-aged folks over here, families back here with kids. Ah, old-timers up here at a table. And the same thing happens at the community, other community centers in, in, in Texas, where the old-timers sit by a table. Why? Some place to put the coffee cup. And uh, so that, that becomes their territory. But the place was packed, and there were four generations at this event. And of course, this is afternoon. Everybody's out of there by uh, 1600, and it all works. OK, other examples of this that we're beginning to investigate a little bit. Uh, cruises for people 70 and plus. Um, there, there, there's all types of cruises that are you know, specialized for all different kinds of audiences. And the one in question here is a disc, there's a, a disco and an electronic dance music cruise uh, for gaby boomers, okay? And here we have, and this is a part of a promotional uh, a, a, a scene, a picture, uh, two ladies enjoying themselves on the cruise. But the cruise is designated for people over 65. All right. So what kind of music are they playing? Easygoing dance music, right? Nothing too, too crazy. Um, other musical experiences we get. Church choirs. Participation in music among the elderly is getting greater than ever. You no longer have to retire your position in the church choir to a youngster just because you're retired. Um, community orchestras very common in locations like university towns or medical centers where you have professionals who are also trained in music. They do this as a, as a hobby. And of course, personal and private music. We really want to get a better handle on what uh, musical experience are done at home or in the car. That might be different from uh, other generations. Okay, conclusion. Again, the age to music trajectory. Uh, in the third age, music as a resource for self fades, as music increasingly serves as a feature, not the essence of collective or community activity. And um, again, the pace of this fading is something we're gonna, we're gonna look investigate more. And of course, the differences by gender, uh, by ethnicity, uh, social class, and everything else. Uh, to date, we're fairly secure in, in suggesting that um, uh, these kinds of phenomena are common across social class and ethnicity. Um, African American old timers in places like Texas will go to music clubs Sunday afternoons, very common kind of activity. Uh, where they hear blues music, able to get home though before it gets too late or too dark. We expect to find this in a range of places, so it's going to be a kind of a pastiche project when we're done. Okay, theory and methods. Here's my argument for a study like this. Um, it's useful to consider using substantive or sensitizing concepts early on in your study. And that's where, that, that's what I receive from looking at the gerontology literature. And so again, we never want to limit ourselves to just sociology or interactionist theory when getting a direction set up for our study. So again, going to gerontology gave me that sense of, you know, you got to be careful who you consider to be a certain co age cohort. It's not all that definitive, okay? Um, so that the substantive or sensitizing concepts uh, help you uh, to figure out how to find out what you're looking for. And when you're doing grounded theory research, by definition, you're never quite sure what you're looking for because grounded theory is an exploratory research strategy, right? If you know what you're looking for, you're probably not doing grounded theory, even though it looks good on your report. Um, but to help you find what you're looking for, and, and that's when it comes to cohorts or populations, that kind of conceptualization could help. 
So, what did I learn from the, the literature? While well, the old age, third age, fourth age, these are categories that are used by people who are experts in the real world of aging. And so they can also be useful in directing an interactionist qualitative study. Uh, now, when do we use primary concepts? The essential concepts, textbook concepts of symbolic interaction. Um, use primary concepts to talk and write about your observations categorically through the language of social science or symbolic interaction. So to analyze the data from a study like this, you really want to get back to status passage, self, situation. Three important concepts in, in this research uh, because that allows you to not only put closure on your study, but it's at that point when you're able to contribute to the existing literature on interactionist concepts. What can we add to our understanding of self or situation, stuff like this? And you want to think about doing that at the end, no, not, not at, the, at the beginning. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, since uh, uh, we're keeping a schedule, and you did well, uh, we have time for perhaps 10 minutes, or a bit more of discussion. And uh, today, -ish, I guess you'll be the first. Let me give you this, uh, since uh, the streaming needs to pick you up. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I, I really love the presentation. And I, I, you know, it's hard to deny, you know, this relationship between age, getting old, and maybe less energy, and looking for more comfortable places. <clears throat> I want to share a few observations I've made recently um, in the UK. Saturday night, the pub. You go to the pub, a special pub. And uh, there are 100 people, probably all over 60. Um, you know, maybe, I'm not sure, 65 maybe. Specifically going for a band, and of course they play, they play all the, the, the songs from the 60s and 70s. They drink like mad, it's like one pint after the other. They continue the lifestyle they probably had. The women uh, dress like they were like teen, uh, teenagers. They also have the... So I'm not sure, this, this, I think there is sort of like a group which I guess continues this lifestyle. And uh, another place which was more, more like a, 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 a sort of like rock punk place. All guys over 60 singing along with The Clash. Bold, big bellies, fat, all t-shirts. I think I have to make uh, pictures of these guys and share this with you. So that's one thing. So I, it, it's, I think it's also a bit real. You are not also a dance guy. I've, I haven't seen you dance last night. So you, uh, uh, did you dance? I'm sorry. I Did you dance last night? A little bit. Yes. Eh? A little bit. I was in Florida. Call it dancing. Oh, you call it dancing. I, I, I thought it was walking. And uh, <laughs> anyhow, I was in Florida for two weeks. The big thing is people go out to music, especially, you know, a little bit Latin music, and dance all night long. So my point is, I've recently, I've seen all these people only going out for music. It's, it's the main thing which is happening, dancing, and um, I'm not sure how to fit it in. It's, it's an extra thing. I'm, I'm not debating you wrong because the proof is there, but I'm, it's interesting to also to interview the, uh, these other people for whom actually this is, you know, they, they might have to recover for two days, I'm not sure, but you know, this is also happening. So this sort of like almost causal reasoning, causality between older, getting older, third age, uh, losing energy and then slowing down. Well, I, I, I have a, at least five or 10 examples which contradict, which is a good thing. You know, I, I tell you how my thinking is, I like those examples a whole lot. Um, when, when I hear about those uh, phenomena and see that kind of thing on TV, the, the imagery to me is, is kind of, popular music culture goes full, full cycle. And so, um, like at our, at our dinner concert last night, you know, what were we doing last night that was unexpected? We weren't dancing. You know, I, I think conceptually we're jumping around. And who jumps around? Little kids. They don't dance either. 
But uh, uh, what that means is that it becomes a form of play. And something like Beatles music becomes an outlet for whatever it is that play helps take care of. Uh, attention, fun, just kind of work up a sweat and go crazy and all kinds of things. Uh, but you get to do that when you're old too. That middle-aged dad, he's not going to go nuts in the music scene, right? Because he's in charge and he's, he's, he's an authority figure. But old timers with short t-shirts, they go bonkers. I got to watch for BBC, I guess. <laughs> it's great. Joe, I missed a little bit of, of your presentation, so maybe you did touch on it. But the role of nostalgia in, in the third age, in as far as music is concerned, uh, to what extent is that important? Because my own, let's call it an existential experience, is that music becomes more and more a vehicle to attach me to society as it has developed, as it was in the past. Whereas when one looks at, at contemporary music, uh, one often gets the, the impression that the music is more a vehicle of society as it is developing, as it is actively going forward. Uh, would that be also a way of looking at the self, uh, reflecting backwards, uh, reminiscing, having these nostalgic memories? Uh, in, in middle age, I would argue that's where it's strongest a factor. The older you get, the less it's nostalgia as it is history in a way. For example, uh, there's, there's lots of celebration over the Beatles currently because every day there's some 50th anniversary of something the Beatles did, okay? And that's of interest to the old timers. You know, they remember, oh, 50 years, it's been that long already. It becomes a, a kind of a, a benchmark for them to use in terms of gauging where they are in relationship to the Beatles. Nostalgia is a funny thing. Um, I don't know if I have any kind of handles on that, but um, I don't know if anybody does, because it's, it's what is it. But one thing that I've recently read that I think has, has importance in sorting out nostalgia in terms of music especially, uh, Simone de Beauvoir wrote a book on aging years ago, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's friend. And, uh, and she, made, she made an interesting argument about, about the self and how um, when the older you get, there's nothing about the self-experience, or yeah, she would have put the existential experience, that tells you you're getting old. And it's, it's not just a matter of labeling from the outside, but it's the matter when you think about your own body, you say, well, I don't know if I'm getting old or not. Things are changing inside my body. Maybe my hearing is getting worse, or maybe I can't stand too long, or this or that. But those aren't automatic, automatic messages that you're getting old. And so she says we got to do is to revisit that notion of, of telling people they're old because that can be a real inhibiting kind of definition of, of self on them. And when I think about that, because I just turned 70 in April, I'm seeing, well, I don't know. I don't know what that means. 70's old, but I don't know what that means like existentially, if you will. And so I'm in my rheumatologist's office. You know, I'm sitting there, typical. That's what you do when you get old, you line up your doctors. And uh, the nurse is taking the vitals and writing down information before the doctor comes in. And she says, well, you just turned uh, 70 last week. Congratulations. You know, you know 70 is new 50. You know? And I told her, I said, I didn't think 50 was all that great. <laughs> but uh, so she walked out. And, uh, but yeah, you know, sorting these things out. And, and so the degree to which there's something about what's ever inside here that's constant and kind of operates independent of labeling and, and external messaging and stuff like that, I think we, we gotta pay some attention on that when it comes to looking at aging. It's a good question. Okay, do we have any other questions, comments? Well, I'll take the liberty to add something to the discussion. Um, not only do I live in a university town, uh, which means there's a problem of alcoholism among people under 25, but I also live in a country where music plays an unusual role in society. Uh, I've been living in Sweden for quite a few years, 
and Sweden, after the United States and the UK, I'm not quite sure which is in first place, Sweden is the third country internationally in the world in the music business, export of music. Um, and people know some of the bad things about Swedish music exports, if you want to put it that way, ABBA, of course, and things like that, or, uh, or Roxette, perhaps. Uh, but uh, Sweden, because of its educational system, among other things, writes a lot of music. They produce a lot of music. There are people who record in North America, people who record in the UK, who are produced by Swedes, who perform music written by Swedes, and one of the most notorious things of all, of course, a music festival or a Eurovision Song Contest um, is uh, run by Swedes, okay? Literally run by Swedes. The top administrator is Swedish. And uh, many of the producers and many of the uh, writers are in fact Swedish. And in addition to this in daily life, there's also a big role to music because in addition to university students, there are choirs, public choirs, clubs, I mean to say, that people of all ages participate in. The kind of music event that you referred to briefly uh, is really quite common. Uh, and there are a lot of people, there's a traditional kind of Swedish dance music, uh, which uh, is not recommended for its musical qualities, but you can drink and dance at the same time. Um, you find older people, older people, 50s, 60s, uh, kind of continuing a lifestyle, often connected with alcohol, uh, but uh, things to do on, in the evenings and even in the winters, inside and in the summers outside. You know, I recall not far from where I live, I'm watching a couple of people uh, after doing an evening of drinking and dance music, uh, trying to pick each other up, you know, in their 60s. They were so drunk, they had trouble kissing each other. They kept missing, you know, they had trouble standing up straight. It seems odd, you know, but it seems somehow very appropriate to the, uh, to the issue that you were discussing. So I just wanted to add that if you... That's a great point. I mean, that points to the need to make this completely comparative because local culture is going to be really, really variant uh, on this. Um, what, um, what it kind of suggests is, you know, make another clarification, in, you know, in defining this study, and that is it focuses on popular music, and that's a tricky term, because that can include everything, in a way, or it can be very limited in terms of musical styles. Immigrants, integrating immigrants into social groups. Here you go. And uh, so, uh, yeah, how do you become American? Become American music fan. That's been the case forever. Um, but what, what I exclude, in a way, at least at this point in the study, are, are, are styles of music, genres that don't really fit what's going on in the kind of stuff I've been talking about, and that is jazz and classical music. Because I recall when, when I was in Sweden, and y'all took me out to a jazz concert, organ, mm -hmm. American jazz band, they were just, just fabulous. And it's so cool to see something like a home group in another country. And they were good, nice crowd and everything, but a jazz crowd's different than this. Jazz crowd doesn't come and go in terms of interest. I would argue in music. It's not as situational an in interest as it is in other styles of pop music. You're a jazz fan all the time. Somebody comes to town who's good, you go see them. So, uh, so jazz is a little bit different. Classical music is kind of the same way. Uh, people who are heavily into classical music as their primary style of music will follow it and, and, and may not experiment as much with other styles of music as people who are more mainstream in, in pop music. But, uh, but the culture, and, and again, immigration, it's gonna be a whole nother area to look into, you're exactly right, which is great. It was just always amazing to me when uh, young people from a Southeast Asian background, largely Vietnamese, immigrating to Houston, Texas, where I lived for a while, um, picking up hip hop music and hip hop culture, like overnight, overnight and calling each other, for example, the N-word, and not knowing with any idea what that means, but that was a common piece of language in hip-hop culture back then. Um, but that's, that's what they did. They became like the other kids in school, and that's what that, that's, that's all about. Good point. Um, 
I notice in the UK that there's a, there is a, a big interest in folk music, and that's a, a folk being quite a wide um, range of music, and that quite often the, attracts an older generation, and the venues are very often places, you know, like clubs and small clubs, but also now bigger concert halls, but like this, so you can sit down in comfortable chairs and listen, and that's certainly an area. But I think it's a bit like jazz in the sense that, it, that you have sort of your devotees that go along specifically, but then they can also sit there and, and be drinking as well. But it's, um, I think that's also a, a genre which is sort of... Um, yeah. that's, like, that's an interesting word you just mentioned, taste. And, and Did taste. I say taste? Taste. Did I? Okay. Yeah. You know, how that fits into all of this it could be very interesting. My guess at this point is it bec it's not a major factor in pop music to begin with. Because mm. taste involves quality. And, and I don't think there's much in literature that says that pop music fans really deal with quality, except that perhaps when it comes to guitar playing skills or specialized kind of things. But in general, it's not a quality issue. It's a difference issue for, for pop music fans. Uh, who would deal with quality? Again, we're getting back to jazz and, and classical. And, and wow. folk as well, because a lot of the people, they play themselves. Yeah. So there, there's also that interest. Yeah. Do you nice. OK, Robert, so you'll be last. Yeah, it was actually something that you, you were almost sort of throwing away, which prompted me to think that uh, we, we were talking about the you know, the people picking each other up and being too drunk to kiss. Um, that there might be just be a danger that we get a bit too prissy and we forget about the, the the association between sex and rock and roll just because we're dealing with older people here. Um, I mean, we one of the things th th there's sort of other kinds of straws in the wind. I would say, Joe, that. We know in the UK there's a growing problem of sexually transmitted infections among the over 60s, you know, that they don't take the protective measures that the kids do. Um, and the, the STI clinics, you know, have, have sort of got this grey population which nobody ever expected to show up. Um, we've also got some evidence of a rising divorce rate among... Uh, what you might call the young elderly, the sort of 65 to 75 group, which, again, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively new phenomenon. People are just kind of noticing it rather than explaining it. Mm. And, it, I mean, it may be another kind of cohort effect, but I, I don't think our discussions of, you know, rock, rock and roll and the old should necessarily leave out the sex and possibly not even the drugs. Um, nice observation. Getting back again to the imagery of, of a cu cultural circle, the notion that, you know, with sexuality in a scene like this thing in Reston, Virginia, there didn't seem any sexuality involved with the old timers. You know, that was an issue for them. Or the little kids by the stage. And so it may have varied in between. And so there's kind of almost an ecology of this kind of thing in, in the concert. But again, yeah, uh, it's, it's not, sexuality is not right in the forefront of what's going on here. If it is, we're hiding it pretty well. But <laughs> okay, um, it's time to move on. Uh, we have to first uh, thank uh, Professor Katarba for his participation, contribution, and thank all of you for uh, being here and uh, participating in the discussion as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.